Yeah, so thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about orbital reef and the future of space exploration. Uh, so I'll jump right into it. Um, so orbital reef you know, it's, it will be the uh, premier mixed-use space station in low Earth orbit for commerce, research, and tourism by the end of the decade. So we're currently in design and development uh, of orbital reef. It's a joint program with Blue Origin. So this is what it will look like in its fully built-out configuration. Uh, which will take a little while to get there because it's a modular scalable system and it, it scales and grows as the market demand uh, requires. So I'll talk you a little bit about the design and the use and the whole vision for Orbital Reef. So NASA is, uh, as the ISS nears the end of its life and will be retired by 2030, NASA does not plan to replace the International Space Station. They are enabling commercial companies to um, provide services for low earth orbit destinations. And so what they're doing from Johnson Space Center is uh, they're using a public private partnership model uh, to uh, promote the, the development and the fielding of commercial space stations in low earth orbit. And they plan to utilize those. Uh, after the ISS is retired in 2030. So that sets the timing of the design and development and fielding of the systems. Um, and that's, as we say, we'll have this in operation by the end of the decade, late 2020s. And this, this image shows the initial baseline configuration. And so that's uh, four major modules plus uh, the big energy mast that you see sticking up at the top. Um, to promote this, NASA has awarded three, what they call commercial destinations free flyer phase one contracts. And uh, the Blue Origin Sierra Space Team won one of those contracts. And that first phase, which we're in now, is, uh, is to formulate and design these uh, destination capabilities. So we're, we're advancing through the program life cycle and we're through the initial phases of uh, system requirements review and system definition review. And we're on our way towards uh, the preliminary design review milestone. Uh, as this goes on, NASA will uh, they envision a phase two, the 2025 to 2030 timeframe. They'll be working with the uh, providers to certify the designs for the use by NASA astronauts and also begin to contract for operational missions uh, prior to the retirement of ISS. So they see it as a kind of a natural transition from the uh, use of the International Space Station to the use of these, these commercial low Earth orbit destinations. So the Orbital Reef team, as I mentioned, is, is the primary partners are Blue Origin and Sierra Space. Together, we're designing the overall system, uh, the operational aspects of the mission, and we're each building major components for the space station itself. So Blue Origin uh, brings the large diameter core module, uh, and they use their reusable heavy lift New Glenn launch system and a space tug, and they're building the energy mast. Uh, at Sierra Space, we're using our expandable life modules uh, and with a docking node, and then our uh, Dream Chaser, a reusable space plane for both crew and cargo delivery. Um, and the unique aspects of Dream Chaser is it's a runway landing vehicle and a low G reentry. And so that opens up a lot of opportunities for the types of research and science that can be done, especially bringing things back to Earth with, with a low G, like one and a half G re-entry instead of a, a high G ballistic re-entry with a splashdown in the ocean. So we can bring back more fragile things from space with that, uh, with that space plane. Uh, Boeing will provide a science module and uh, they're also with all their experience with the International Space Station will support station operations, maintenance engineering, and they also have their uh, CST-100 crewed spacecraft as an option as well. So we have dissimilar redundancy and how to get to and from the space station with both cargo and crew. Uh, Redwire uh, comes in with a lot of the actual operational use of the space station, like microgravity R&D, manufacturing, payloads, deployable structures, and di digital engineering. Uh, Genesis is developing a single person spacecraft. So basically uh, to allow EVA without having to be in a, a spacesuit. Uh, and then Arizona State is leading a consortium of, of global universities uh, to support research and development and public uh, use of the space station. 
<clears throat> and then we have Amazon who joined the team and they're working with logistics maintenance and uh, internal robotics and automation. So that's the team working together uh, to develop and field the orbital reef station. So the idea here is to, um, is to uh, when you look at the International Space Station you know, produced by multiple government agencies working together, um, that space station, very expensive, uh, also in, in high demand for use, doesn't, it allows research and development, but not on the rapid pace that the commercial customers are really looking for. One of the key things as far as research and development goes, developing materials, um, biopharma, uh, types of things that want to be, that industry wants to do with the commercial destination. It's the rapid repeat of, uh, of science and R&D that they're after. It's like, we'll put an experiment up there, we'll operate the experiment, we'll learn from it, and then we'll go back and iterate. Uh, with the ISS, the, the iteration time is spread over years. And if you can't iterate uh, at all, uh, and the idea of these commercial LEO destinations is you can do a much faster iteration. The, uh, the baseline configuration for, for orbital reef provides a, a permanent presence in space with about 90% of the International Space Station's volumes. So that's the baseline. The picture shown here is the fully built out configuration. So much more volume and capacity is envisioned with orbital reef than currently available in the ISS. Orbital reef is designed to, uh, with a baseline, support 10 astronauts and multiple internal and external payloads. Orbital reefs being designed for a 15 year lifespan and um, consists of uh, six destinations elements. That's where I talked about that. And I'll show you a little bit more detail about the life module, the node, the energy mast, the core module and the research module and single person spacecraft. Those together make up the baseline configuration. Transportation vehicles to support orbital reef will start flying this year um, and through 2026. As we talk about the Boeing CST-100, the cargo version of Dream Chaser, and then the crewed version of Dream Chaser built by CR Space. So really the idea here is turnkey services for global markets, providing all the essentials necessary to make a, a truly commercial platform in space. These are the major elements and just another view of the individual modules. So obviously the, the new Glenn heavy lift launch vehicle, which is in development, the Dream Chaser, which is in development here at Sierra Space, Boeing Starliner, and then a space tug that's used to get some elements um, off the launch vehicle into the orbital reef. Um, the modules themselves, the, the large core with really big uh, windows with an incredible view of the earth, uh, the research module, and then the inflatable life habitat, which I'll show you a little bit more about in a minute. And that's one of the key technologies uh, being brought by Sierra Space here as well. Um, our node, which provides both um, payload capability and uh, a uh, docking ports, as well as an EVA capability with an airlock. And then this is the big uh, energy mass, which provides power and thermal uh, dissipation for, for the systems. And then the uh, single person, person spacecraft, one person can go do an EVA in an essentially short sleeve environment. So those are all the components that, that make up the orbital reef. And this is what the cutaway of the baseline configuration looks like. So uh, over here on the left are the, are the modules built by Sierra Space. You can see the node with the airlock and an astronaut in there and then the docking ports. And so um, that allows, uh, there's both crew quarters in there. There's uh, science payload support, ECLIS, which is the environmental control and life support system and an astro garden in there. Sierra Space is, uh, is flying experiments today on the International Space Station to grow um, vegetables in space. Uh, then the, the big inflatable life habitat. So I'll give you a little bit better view of this in a minute. But it is uh, essentially the, the, the key of the life habitat is it, it packs down into a standard five meter fairing, which allows a fairly low cost uh, to launch to space. And then when you get on orbit, um, you inflate it uh, to about 300 cubic meters. So it has three decks. It's very expansive. We have a full scale uh, mock-up of it down at uh, NASA Marshall. As you go walk around in that compared to a standard module, which would look more like the node, the, uh, the modules on the International Space Station um, just aren't as big as this big inflatable environment. 
And then Blue Origin's core, which is really sized by the upper stage of the New Glenn launch vehicle. So it's, uh, it's quite a bit bigger in diameter than a what would be in a standard five meter fairing. This can fit with a standard, with a seven meter fairing, so much bigger. And, um, and then their energy mast, which doesn't really show up here much other than this kind of line pointing down. But <clears throat> the core and the mast um, provides all kinds of services to the space station, plus a big interior volume. Um, for and I'll show you a good picture here in a minute. It gives you an idea of the of the size and scale of that, and then the uh, the big uh, research module that'll come on board as uh, as the demand for the services grow. So the the key thing about the space station, it's just like the ISS. It's modular. It's scalable. It's built over time, and it grows in size really as the market demands it. Uh, so that's how it's designed to be. Uh, grown essentially in space. So here's, here's the idea of the scale. On the left are some pictures from modules from the International Space Station. And on the right is what the inside of the core would look like. And so and you can see the big windows up here. These are sizable, pretty impressive. They have some full scale engineering units of those windows. They're optically very clear uh, and just amazing how big they are. Uh, when, you, when you stand in front of those windows and, and look out, it's, it's gonna be like you're out in space, not contained in a in a module. So uh, really impressive how big the size of this is and what's coming. So it's quite interesting to uh, to see how where this is going and how it's scaling. Here's some more pictures just to get some views of the different the core module. You can see, get a feel here for a person up against these windows, uh, how big they actually are, how open and expansive uh, these modules are. And also the other key thing is um, how, if you go back and you look at ISS on the left, <laughs> they have quite a bit of, uh, of stuff uh, exposed, a lot of cable, a lot of wiring. There've been a lot of lessons learned from ISS. That's really one of the interesting things about our team and the program is that many on our team have heritage experience with the design development, fielding and operations of the International Space Station. There's been a lot of lessons learned, both from just outfitting human factors, the crew experience, the overall environment uh, that you're in. ISS is relatively noisy. Um, and so, and there's a lot of cables all over the place. And so as we design Orbital Reef, we're looking ahead to a much, you know, a much cleaner configuration, much more hospitable environment for the crew. There's a lot of lessons learned being taken from the people who actually built the ISS and have flown and operated the ISS um, to how we're approaching Orbital Reef. So those lessons learned are, are, are quite interesting. It's really one of the more fascinating things about working on this is what we've learned over the 20 plus years of operating ISS and how we apply those lessons learned to the future. It's really the neat, probably one of the most interesting things to be involved with. And there's things that you would never think of, um, like logistics. So how do you stow? What do you do with spare hardware? Where is it stowed? How do you find it when you need it? Um, things do get lost on the International Space Station. There's people on the ground who are you know, meticulously keeping track of where every last piece of, of hardware is and goes. Um, and so as we look ahead and you see that Amazon's on the team and they're looking at logistics, that is really an interesting part of this. The maintenance of the systems, how you design it, how you maintain it, how you operate it, it's, it's really interesting to get in there and think about, you know, we need to design these systems for the ability to do main, maintenance. So you can imagine they're in the ISS, it constantly takes about two people full time to keep that system operational. As we look ahead to Orbital Reef, we want to be commercial, we want to be more affordable, we need to think about that maintenance load. The, as we envision operating Orbital Reef, you know, we envision a, a crew on board of maybe two people who are, are there to for the health and the upkeeping and the, the safety of, of the commercial crew and visitors that come to and from. So you don't want those people to be simply doing maintenance all day. So we have to think about that as we design this and it's really fascinating. We also have to think about safety and, and, and failure 
uh, tolerance and how we design the system for reliability, for redundancy, for safety. What happens when a system goes down? Uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about is what's the time to effect if a system goes offline? Is there a backup system that automatically comes online? Uh, or is it okay for the system to be down? If it's down, how long will it take to repair and get it back to operations? What do you do if you have a major failure and you need to evacuate a module and go to another one and close the hatch? That's a, that's a, a viable path. There also will always be a, um, a lifeboat on board, essentially a way to abandon the station if you had to, which you don't want to do, obviously. So the engineering that goes into this in terms of all these aspects of design of the system is that's what we're doing now is figuring all that out. It's quite interesting and challenging thing to do. And it's some of the most in, probably impressive thing in 33 years of uh, aerospace engineering on my part that I've seen and been part of. So really interesting to work on these kind of systems. So you can see the inside of the research module as it implies it's very focused on onboard onboard payloads, onboard experiments, onboard science. The LIFE module, uh, the, which stands for the Large Inflatable Flexible Environment, um, that's where the crew lives and um, works. Um, they have both payloads on board and living quarters, uh, exercise quarters, health and medical quarters. With three decks and that big expansive space, uh, there's a lot of room inside there to accommodate uh, up to 10 crew members and then the single person spacecraft, which is that, um, that small EVA capability without having to be in a, in a spacesuit itself. So those are the, some of the aspects of orbital reef uh, that are interesting. And here's another just really good view of what the inside of the core looks like. Much cleaner uh, envisioned than the ISS. Challenge to get there though, very much an engineering challenge to make this a uh, reality. And as we, as we do the design phase right now, this is what we're focused on. How do, we, how do we achieve something like this from an engineering standpoint, but then take maintenance in account? You know, if you close everything up behind walls, then how do you get to it if you need to do maintenance? So you'll have panels that open and ways to access things. All has to be taken into consideration uh, as you design this. So uh, I talked a little bit about Dream Chaser. So Dream Chaser is uh, as a revolutionary advancement in space transportation to orbital reef and, and other commercial destinations. It's the, currently the only runway capable commercial space plane uh, in development. It's designed for 15 or more missions, highly reusable, can carry six tons or more of cargo to uh, low Earth orbit. And I mentioned a low G reentry. And it also has no toxic fuel, and that's actually really important for turnaround. And when they landed the space shuttle, uh, it was highly toxic. So it, was, it took a lot of time to save the vehicle, get it safe for people to be around. Uh, people were going out in hazmat suits and checking it out and making sure it was safe for the, the crew to deplane uh, and for the, the maintenance people to come in and, and take care of the vehicle with no toxic fuel and much more rapid access uh, to, the, to the crew and the cargo as it comes back from space. So really incredible uh, technology being developed here and uh, at, uh, at Sierra Space here in Colorado. So here's a little bit more on the life habitat. And so, and it's an expandable uh, soft goods structure with, with a rigid core. So basically the, the rigid core structure is, is the internal frame from which all the, um, the soft goods pack down around. This is a full scale mock-up of it that I mentioned is uh, down at Marshall Space Flight Center. So this, uh, when it's uh, packed down, it's inside a five meter fairing. Uh, when it's expanded and fully inflated, it's 27 feet long, 27 feet in diameter. Um, so it's quite sizable when you go walk around in it. It's just really impressive, uh, especially if you, Look at one of the existing like ISS modules that they have the full scale uh, high fidelity mockups down at Johnson Space Center. You look at those compared to this, and it's a marked difference in, in size and volume. And those are the things that um, are really attractive because this helps bring the cost down uh, to actually do the commercial operations. Um, so it's uh, it's in development now. We've been working with NASA for a number of years under the Next Step 2 contract to develop this technology. So we've been doing a number of different um, tests 
with, uh, with micrometeoroid uh, protection. And when this is inflated, the, um, the material that's used for the structural rigidity of the, uh, of the module are uh, Vectran straps. It's like a big basket weave. You can sort of catch a glimpse of it here in the upper right. And when I show, I'll show you a video in a minute where you can see, essentially it's, it's these uh, many different uh, layers uh, that are impermeable that, are, uh, that contain the environment within the, uh, the, the uh, module. And then these, this basket weave strap system that is the external shell, when it inflates and becomes rigid, it is stronger than steel. So a Vectran is a very strong uh, woven material that we use to build this system. And we're doing tests now. We're doing both burst and creep testing. So we're building test articles of this system and then we're uh, pressurizing them to failure. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos in a minute and you get an idea. Um, these systems are uh, proven to be extremely strong with very long life. Um, the, the life expectancy of, of that structure is in the many thousands of years. And so it's, it's very strong. And then on the outside, there will be blanketing layers that provide um, micrometeoroid and orbital debris protection. So even if it gets hit by uh, an object in space that uh, can't be detected by radar in advance, um, it can stand up to it with, with multiple layers of, of um, fabric like Kevlar or Vectran and then foam uh, layers between to dissipate energy. So they are designed to be very strong, very survivable, um, very uh, strong systems. So we're testing that. So what I'll, what I'll show you here is here, this is a test article of the life habitat. It's one third scale, still pretty good size. It's about nine feet long is what you see here, about nine feet in diameter. Uh, and then you can see really well the, the rope woven straps and we actually painted the white paint with a little, all these little black dots that allows optical strain detection. So we can actually see as the system begins to uh, fail, how it's performing. And so what we did was we took this one third scale test article, put it on a test stand, and then we pressurized it uh, until it fail failed. It uh, exceeded its uh, designed pressure. A successful test would have, uh, it would have burst at 180 PSI and we achieved over 200 PSI. And that's because of the scaling and the factors of safety that go in. And they're gonna be pressurized on orbit to around you know, 14 PSI or a little bit less. So we're pressurizing to 200 PSI to demonstrate factors of safety and also take into account, this is a one third scale article. So I'll show you a high speed video of this uh, failing at, at the highest pressure. So around two, well over 200 PSI is where this is gonna finally, finally fail. So pretty, pretty impressive strength. The amount of force that was on this at pressurized at that level was really incredible. Um, I'll wind it back one more time. You can see it start to separate. And then I've got another view from a, taken from a tower a little ways away. So what you'll see here is uh, the article is actually down in a flame trench. This is the old Saturn 1B test stand at Marshall Space Flight Center. It has a big concrete underground flame trench. We actually dropped it down in there to contain all the shrapnel that was gonna occur from the structure as it explodes. And so what you'll see in this video, there's a camera sitting on a tower up here watching. And when it fails, you're gonna see the shock wave of uh, the explosion hit this camera. So it's, uh, it's no, no small release of energy. It's pretty impressive to see this. So here I'll run it and you'll see this go. So it just gives you a sense of how much energy was released when that, when that failed. It was uh, pretty impressive to be there. We were about a mile away when it went off inside a building and it was a very loud bang. And that was it at third scale. So this summer we'll, we'll be uh, doing this with full scale article. 
So the full scale life habitat will pressurize it to failure. And uh, that'll, be, that'll be quite the uh, explosion when that occurs. So what do we use orbital reef for? There's really a lot of envisioned uh, applications for this. You know, the classic things that are being done with ISS, with NASA wanting to go uh, do their exploration. Uh, research, national research, excuse me for a second, I'm gonna cough. Um, national research in the, in the facilities on board or orbital reef, the typical things that NASA is, is doing on board ISS. With, with more um, volume as we build this out, we'll be able to, ability to scale this up and do it more frequently and more often. Uh, exploration services, so definitely NASA tends to be a, a, a strong user of, this, of these LEO destinations as they think about um, training astronauts as they look ahead to lunar and even like Mars missions. So developing those systems, training, doing analog missions for potentially lunar and Mars, uh, in orbit support of satellites, that's being considered as well. Um, even someday you can envision maybe we'll build satellites in space. Um, we'll do all kinds of advanced techniques to build small satellites in space, cut down the launch cost. Uh, commercial industry, I, I mentioned, the, the uses of microgravity are incredible. And so there's a ton of applications to open up uh, research and production of uh, biopharma, uh, drugs, advanced materials, lots of applications there. And then there's definitely consumer ideas, like who's gonna film the first movie in space? Somebody's gonna do it. Um, there's a lot of interest in using, if you could get the cost down, it's, there's a line of sight to actually being able to use this to do a concert from space, do movies from space that's being talked about and there's a lot of buzz around it. And then the basic travel and tourism like you're seeing today uh, with ISS with some of these private astronaut missions. So that's being envisioned. So the future is orbital reef. You know, it's, we, we view it as like a 21st century real estate development project in space. We're developing all these baseline elements and modules. We have a very experienced and well-rounded team with a lot of, uh, a lot of past experience operating uh, both ISS and uh, other space flight missions intended to be a global focus to support diverse customers. So Martina sets my pitch. Well, fantastic. Uh, greatly appreciate, Scott, your, your presentation. I mean, there's a lot of great insights and obviously as we're kind of running low on time here a little bit, uh, for the people who are watching the session or if you're watching this after recording, you can find a speaker list with including uh, included uh, speaker information that could be directly to request a meeting. If somebody you're gonna come in from a research background, a business or, or a company would like to reach out to Scott with your questions, schedule one-on-one -on -one meeting and discuss business uh, opportunities. You're gonna find the link included there. Uh, but for you, Scott, uh, greatly appreciate uh, the time. Uh, phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, uh, you know, captured my, uh, you know, attention and and uh, j just to see how much work actually goes into creating the station itself, right? Once you explaining the pressurized pressurized vessels, and of course, I've seen the videos on on LinkedIn too. But once you go into details, you really understand how big of a complex task. Uh, I mean, the entire team is working on, which is very, I mean, impressive. And and it, you know, again, with the given timelines, I mean, it's it, it becomes even more impressive. Right. So, but uh, really, so we're going to be looking forward to the next steps uh, with Orbital Reef for sure from Sierra Space as we're going to continue to follow through social media and for people also, including part of the link, you can find Sierra Space website and details included where you can also follow uh, Sierra Space and Orbital Reef and their uh, journey towards building this incredible, incredible piece of equipment here. So, uh, Scott, once again, greatly appreciate your time and hopefully we can catch up next year too. And, and maybe bring even more uh, insights to the people out there, so. Thank you very much. Thank you.